And welcome and thank you all for coming. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Cheryl Brunette. Actually, I'm still Cheryl Brunette for those of you who do know me. Um, and I'm here tonight because I had a major heart event a couple of years ago and I survived. Um, through the grace of some extraordinary good luck and the mad skills and kindness of some really fine health professionals, I was given more years of life. And I decided at that very moment to stretch the number of those years out as much as I could and to do them with some semblance of good health. So that threw me into a frenzy of going through cardiac rehab and also doing research. And as I was researching, I came across this organization called Women Heart, and it is a national coalition of women with heart disease. And I was accepted into their 2020 cohort at the Mayo Clinic Women Heart Science and Leadership Symposium, where I got an absolute bang up introduction to cardiology from the med school professors, from the women who started the cardiology clinic at the, um, at the Mayo Clinic. And they're very education oriented. So it was really a privilege to be able to participate in that. But when we were done, they said, okay, we gave you a great education and now this is your job. Go out and tell your story and get information out there that's vital to women's heart health and maybe save, save a life, maybe. Um, so here I am. And um, this, by the way, is being recorded for those of you who didn't catch it. And don't, I'll post it on the MIF website when it's done and probably some other places. But I, and I will also put up the PowerPoint that we're going to have and um, a list of resources that you can consult. So um, you don't have to scramble to take notes. And I'm really glad you're here because, and I've got notes down here. I scripted this part because it's the first time I'm giving it and on Zoom. Heart disease is the number one killer of women in North America. Heart disease kills more men than women every year in the United States by raw numbers. Heart disease kills on average, on average between seven and 12 times, but on average 10 times as, women, as many women as breast cancer every year in this country. In fact, it kills more women than all cancers put together. Women patients are, heart patients are misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and undertreated more than male heart patients. And well over half of the women in this country are not aware of their heart disease risk factors. And yet at least 80% or up to 80% of your risk factors can be mitigated by changing behaviors and can really give you the likelihood of a better outcome. So I wanna start, I'm gonna start at the very basic, which is with your heart. Your heart is as big as your fist and it sits not over here where you do I pledge allegiance, but right here, basically in the center of your chest, just barely left of the sternum. And when you're at rest, which should be now, it beats <laughs> a little more than every second, a little more often than that, which adds up to be 100,000 beats per day. That's a lot of work that it does. If you're active, it's going to beat more times than that. And these beats aren't these like gentle little thrusts. That's sort of what they feel like in the interior that, oh man, I can feel my heart beat sometimes. And isn't that wonderful? If in fact, I mean, they are hard jolts. If you were, God forbid, to be severed and you have your aorta severed, your, your first spurt would shoot 10 feet. That's how powerful it is. So it's good that it's this strong because if you took all the blood vessels in your body, the veins and the 
arteries and these teeny tiny little capillaries, many, many of those. And you lay them out end to end. How, how far do you think they would go? Roughly how many miles of blood vessels? Anybody want to like unmute themselves and give me a number? Nope. <laughs> no guesses? Okay. They're all on mute, Cheryl. Huh? They're all on mute. I told them they can unmute themselves. Oh, you did that? Did you mute everyone? <laughs> oh, never mind. Okay, we haven't entirely coordinated this part of it. Okay, it's 100,000 miles. 100,000 miles. The circumference of the Earth around the equator is 25,000 miles. Your blood vessels in your body, or in the average adult body, could laid on end on end, could circle the Earth four times. That's a lot of distance to push blood. So this is a powerful little pump. Um, and so more about the muscle itself. And I can show you pictures of hearts and I have looked at pictures, anatomical pictures of hearts. I have all kinds of them, but I get confused when I look at them because there are all sorts of things going on, things coming in, things going out, there are valves, there, it's sort of wrapped around. So I do better when I visualize it this way. There are four chambers in your heart. Two on the top, they're smaller. Two on the bottom, a little bit larger. The two on the top are called the atria, the, or each one individually, atrium. There's a right atrium and a left atrium, and they are the receivers of the blood that comes in. And it makes good sense, I mean, it makes logical sense, because in Latin, atrium means entry room. So the blood enters in on the right side. We're gonna start there. Although it's of course a continuous loop that goes through your body, but we have to start somewhere. Goes into your right atrium, then is pumped down to the right ventricle, which is the two chambers on the bottom are the, really are the hardworking pumps. And they have a right side and a left side, just like the top. So blood that is blue and has ha had most of the oxygen taken out of it enters to the right, goes down into the right ventricle, gets pumped out to your lungs, circulates in your lungs, picks up oxygen, comes back around, goes into the left top and the left atrium pumps it down into the left ventricle and the left ventricle pumps it to your entire body. So the left ventricle, this is an important thing to remember for later. The left ventricle is the real powerhouse of the heart. And um, I said it, your heart beats 100,000 times a day. Well, your, your blood doesn't entirely circulate 100,000 times with every beat. I mean, that'd be silly. It can't go around that fast, but it does go through your, your body pretty fast you visualize a single blood cell and as it works its way through the system it takes about 50 seconds just under a minute maybe 52 seconds to make it all the way around your body and to come back and be in that um in that same circle again where it started let's say it started at the top of the right um atrium Let's see, what else am I supposed to tell you here? <clears throat> oh, you know, the, the left ventricle, this, I don't, this is not here right now, but the left ventricle that pumps to your entire body, the walls of that are th between three and six times thicker than the walls in the right atrium, I mean, right ventricle. And that's because it has to pump harder and farther. Um, and each of those four chambers has a valve that opens up and lets the blood go to the next step and it keeps the blood from backing up it's they're like check valves if you've ever seen a check valve liquid can go through in one way but it can't come through that the other way it holds it so you have these four check valves you have one between the one on each side between the atrium and the ventricle and then one um on the out, out pipes Right, and so it comes back up and goes around that way. 
you have these four chambers that are squeezing and relaxing, but they're not all doing it at the same time, right? This is a very sophisticated and complex system to keep firing so that the atriums just in a, a hair of a part of a second, they fire before the ventricles fire. And how is this all coordinated? Well, that's a, coordinated by a different system in the heart. It has its own little electrical system. So there's a, the, the electrical system, the, the, main, um, the main box, let's say the, the, the breaker box is up in the right atrium and it sends out a signal and it, it goes down, it branches down into your heart. And so everything fires. It, it's, it's the most miraculous system that it's really wonderful that it, um, sometimes it's amazing to think that it works as well as it does. So, oh, there's one more anatomical, one more anatomical thing I want you to know about the heart. Here it has all this blood going through it. And on this side, that blood is very um, oxygen enriched, but none of the blood that goes through those chambers nourishes the heart. And that all just goes through and it goes out to nourish the body and to return and get re replenished and nourish the body. What nourishes the heart are some arteries that sit on top of the muscle. So the, they're major arteries that sit on the muscle and then branch, just so many branches coming off of those main arteries, three main ones that I can think of right here, and they will become part of my story. Um, and then bunches of other smaller vessels that go down into the muscle of the heart. And that's how the heart gets its own nourishment. So it's interesting because when the left ventricle pumps, the brain takes 15% of the, of the blood, the kidneys take 20% of the blood, and the heart itself takes between five and 7% of the blood. I mean, it grabs some of its own blood to nourish itself. Okay. So you may have some questions at this point, but I'm gonna ask you to hold them until I go through the PowerPoint because I'll revisit some of these things. But the reason I wanted you to have an idea of the basic structure <clears throat> of the heart and the circulatory system is because that way we can talk about disease, for example. Now I have to figure out how to find my PowerPoint. Here we go. Can everyone see that? I want to make it full screen. Yeah, sure. We can see it. <laughs> Beyond bikini medicine? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, there we go. All right. This is women and their health. Women as they have been taken care of all these years. When, you, when women go for their checkups, and typically what they do is they get a mammogram and a pap smear. That's, that's what the cardiologists call bikini medicine, but women have body parts that are beyond bikini medicine. And that's what we're gonna be looking at a little bit today. You can't read everything that's on here, but there is a real misconception about how prevalent heart disease is in this country. And there, it's, it's a belief system that it's primarily a men's disease, which is not true. It is also a belief system that it, it, it doesn't kill as many people as cancer, which is also not true. But here, this, these figures are for 2016. And my figures do not include, like I didn't look at anything from 2020 on because COVID has really changed the picture. And it's too early to have really a lot of solid research and data to be able to draw solid conclusions yet. So I'm going back to really traditional from the la last couple of decades. On the far left is the column. It's a, that, that from bottom to top, that column is 100% of deaths in the United States in 2016. The, notice the blue at the top, that's the main cause, that's heart disease. It takes a, it was 30%, 30.2% of people who were killed by heart disease that year. And cancer killed almost as many people, 29.5%. So let's say 30% died of heart disease, 30% died of cancer. And way, way, way down at the bottom that you guys can't even see, 
there's, well, you can see suicide, that kind of mm, gray turquoisey little strip. Suicide accounted for 1.8% of the deaths. Just under that is this tiny kind of gray strip that was homicides. They were 0.9% of the deaths of that year. And then on that, for what really happened, you can't see it down there, but it is deaths from terrorism. And they were 0.01%, one hundredth of 1%, actually less than one hundredth of 1% were deaths from terrorism. So that same year, these people analyzed how many Google searches there were about deaths in the United States. They found that only 2% of the deaths <laughs> that when people were looking, death by heart attack was only Googled 2% of the time. Cancer was really important. It was Googled 37% of the time. So that's at least comparable to how, how realistic it is that that's how many people get cancer and die from it. But look at down at the bottom, you can start to see suicide, homicide, and terrorism. You can see that they were Googled a lot more proportionately to what they actually occurred, right? Then the two right columns are from media. The, the third from the left is the New York Times, and then the one on the far right is The Guardian, which is a British newspaper, which is really a very reputable newspaper. And these now are the, these are the percentages of the coverage in their newspapers about deaths in the United States. There was two and a half percent coverage by the New York Times of deaths by heart, heart disease and 35.6% of coverage with, of coverage of deaths was of terrorists. So if it bleeds, it bleeds. That means that if it's sensational enough, if it's bloody enough, it will leave the news stories. And that's also true of, of um, television. So on to real heart disease. Diseases of the heart come in many flavors. There are congenital defects like holes between the chambers. There are these, for example, this, there's, a cha there's a, some tissue, like a wall, a thinner wall that come, goes between both sides and at the top and the bottom. And that can have tiny holes in it, which is really interesting. Also congenitally, um, there are problems with valves sometimes. I just read this past week, an article about a 12 year old girl in Washington DC who had open heart surgery because, well, she was a cheerleader and they didn't discover this till she was 12 years old. She was one of the, she was the one that the kids threw up in the air, the flyer and her pediatrician was listening to her heart and heard something unusual. Well, it turns out that she had been born with one of her major arteries in the wrong place and it wasn't feeding what it was supposed to feed, but it didn't manifest until she was physically active. Sometimes congenital defects do not manifest until pregnancy because pregnancy is such a tax on your entire system. Um, Another kind of flavor of heart disease are arrhythmias, and that's an electrical system problem. And that can be, that has to do with your heartbeat, how fast it goes, how slow it goes. Sometimes it goes way too slow, sometimes way too fast. You've heard of atrial fibrillation, that it almost flutters and it can't compress. Um, that's an electrical problem. Um, other things is sometimes it just doesn't fire in the right order or, it, things just get glitched out in a nerve. So that can be problems. There are infections. <laughs> Always get your teeth cleaned and don't get periodontal disease because the, the bacteria from periodontal disease are just, it's just one kind of bacteria that can enter into your bloodstream and it can land in your heart. I went to cardiac rehab with a guy who was there because he had to have his valve replaced and, which is an open heart surgery, and it was because it, it had become infected. Um, there are peripheral artery diseases. So you have 
you can get the you can get narrowing in your legs or in your it's usually legs or arms and i mentioned valve defects and at the bottom you see a whole there are five stars and then six stars coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease the that is by far the most common variety of heart disease in this country and it is well really in the in the developed world and it is a narrowing of the arteries by gunk cleaning <laughs> by cholesterol by plaque forming on the inside and it narrows them so that's called ischemia when you get some narrowing of the arteries so that when it happens in your heart arteries it can cause a heart attack because you're not getting enough nourishment there so that's the disease that i'm going to talk about most just because it's the most prevalent and here are a few kinds of heart disease that are a little bit different and um, they're more rare and they hit women the hardest. And interestingly, a couple of these have only been recognized for about 20 years because prior to that, they weren't even known and women weren't studied. Um, one is microvascular disease. Remember when I told you that the heart arteries lay on the top and then all these tiny vessels go down into the heart muscle, sometimes, a person can have a heart artery that you could drive a truck through, but all these little arteries that go down into the muscle, which really feed the heart, they get stopped up and that can cause a heart disease, um, a heart attack. And that it's more common among women than men. SCAD is much more prevalent among women than men and it's called sudden coronary artery dissection it's a really interesting condition and it was identified it's one of those things that wasn't identified for quite some time on the interior of your artery there's a lining called the endothelial lining and it think teflon nice and smooth if it doesn't have anything gunked onto it but in some women because women have more delicate tissues it sometimes in a perfectly healthy woman, no kind of um, buildup of anything inside the artery, it will tear. The endothelial level or layer will tear. And when it tears, it makes a little flap. And the, your blood is rushing through there, and the blood gets behind this flap, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it, that flap ends up cutting off the blood supply, and you have a heart attack. It's just as it's the same kind of heart attack as if you um, had your artery totally closed by plaque and calcium. Um, another one, this one's fascinating. And I just read a new article about it. There appears to be, I didn't, I said I wasn't going to talk about COVID, but broken heart syndrome, also known as Takotsubo, it was called um, because that's where it was actually studied and first really looked at very carefully was in Japan. And a takotsubo is an octopus trap. So think of something that's narrow at the top. Remember, your ventricle is kind of shaped like that. But think of something that's narrow at the top, and then it bulges out at the bottom. And it, it hits postmenopausal women most of all. And it almost always is a result of a very stressful situation frequently the loss of a long-term partner. And it is the only condition that will right itself by itself, that it usually after five or six weeks, it comes back in. And the article that I just read was, there seems to be a really strong uptick in Takotsubo since um, this last year. And they don't know why. It's either because we're being able to identify it more carefully or because of all the heartbreak and stress that goes on around what's going on with COVID. Um, and the, another one other condition that women tend to get more frequently than men <clears throat> is vasospasms, which means you, it's just what it sounds, a vessel spasms. And it's just like having it fill in with um, cholesterol and plaque. It just cramps and closes and cuts off. Another ischemic condition. It cuts off blood to your heart or wherever.
Okay, it could, I mean, it can happen, you know, you don't want it to happen and give you a stroke too. So let's go on. Ah, so I Googled, what does a heart attack look like? <laughs> and this is what I got. Ha Google having a heart attack and notice this is, I did Google images that I didn't cherry pick this. These were the pictures that came up at the top. There are a dozen. Of the dozen, there are only two women and one of the women is helping a man who's having a heart attack. Um, now, no, and everyone is clutching their chest. And I just want to say that this is not what every heart attack looks like. In fact, it might not look like this at all. This looks almost like cardiac arrest, which is an entirely different kettle of fish. But this is another reason that we have the misperception that, well, it's not a reason. This is an example of how we misperceive this as a man's disease. And the reason I put that as the next slide is because I wanted to talk about the heart attack. What exactly is it? A heart attack in the vernacular of your doctor will, is called an MI or myocardial infarction. And it just means a rather dramatically reduced blood flow to the heart. And it happens usually in the coronary arteries. The three main coronary arteries are, there's one to your right side, then there's one that called the left anterior artery. And it, what it does is it's the one that goes right down to the left ventricle, the main pump. And it's, that's the one that's called, called the widow maker. If that one is blocked, the likelihood of survival is about 12%. Um, there's also a left circumflex. There's a branch off of the, the left artery that goes around to the side of the heart. So <clears throat> reduced blood flow to the heart. If that's done, what happens is it kills tissue, the muscle dies, you cannot regenerate any kind of heart muscle. Once it's dead, it's dead. So there's a heart attack every 40 seconds in the United States. The average age for having the first heart attack is 66 for men and 71 for women. The onset for women being later, sometimes they figure even 10 years for onset of heart disease is based on hormones. Estrogen is the, the um, theory and there's some credence to that. 26% of women die within one year of a heart attack, as opposed to 19% of men. Why is that? Well, it has to do with differential treatment, but um, there might be other reasons. Women seem to have a harder time with heart attacks than men. One in 16 women over the age of 20 has coronary artery disease or coronary, coronary vascular disease and one in 13 men. <coughs> this is a really, this was one of the most interesting things I learned early on. During the Vietnam War, there were many young men that were killed and they had the opportunity to do a lot of research by doing autopsies and looking at the arteries of these young men. And more than 70% of these young men had already started laying down plaque in their arteries. So it starts, it starts when almost when you're a child. I've even heard some doctors say it starts at infancy. I'm not sure that's the case, but it starts when you're a very young child. So it takes years to build up the kind of plaque that's going to close off your heart flow. Ah, don't be confused. So those pictures that we saw, a heart attack is the myocardial infarction. It's a plumbing problem, right? An artery gets squeezed off for some reason, a flap gets in the way, the gunk fills it in, um, but there's not enough blood to the muscle. Unless, and that, I, you know, I've seen different numbers that you need to restore blood to that muscle within 20 to 30 minutes. And some say as high as an hour um, versus sudden cardiac arrest. When someone collapses, when someone grabs her chest and falls over and their heart is not beating. In with 
a myocardial infarction, the heart keeps beating. It's just that it's very feeble because it's not getting enough nourishment. Cardiac arrest is an electrical glitch. The signal doesn't go out, the heart stops. It's, it is usually fatal. There is usually no warning for it whatsoever. It just happens. One figure that I've heard that's marginally, well, a little bit disturbing is that 25% of all first presentations of heart disease in this country is sudden death, whether it's cardiac arrest or some other reason. So, so you can plan, you can eat good food, you can do all sorts of stuff and you might die anyway, <laughs> but um, which is just the way it is. So here's, here is a graphic of sudden cardiac arrest. It's a problem that's electrical. It simply, it strikes without warning. The heart suddenly stops beating. There's no blood that's pumped to the rest of the body. Whereas the heart attack, you can have early signs. You may have early signs, probably you will. You can see here's a little piece of artery with that bit of plaque that's sticking up there. It's not just that it grows until it closes. What happens is see that little mountain of plaque, it will rupture. And when it ruptures, <clears throat> your blood wants to respond. It's like, oh no, something is broken open and we want to clot over that. We want to stop that broken piece. We want to take care of it. And so it's actually the clotting action that can stop it. People do have a pulse in heart attack. By the way, a heart attack can lead though to sudden cardiac arrest. It can be such a stressful event. So here are, <laughs> I, I can't see my own um, things in, in front of me because I have something across my screen that's about controls. Okay, so the, there's a quote at the top of this that says, the eye only sees what the mind is prepared to comprehend. You could be having symptoms, and if you didn't know that they were heart attack symptoms, then you might not see that that was something that you had to take care of. You wouldn't see that. I, you would, I would feel indigestion, but I wouldn't see that as a possible sign that I was going to have a heart attack. So some of the symptoms of an MI are angina, also pronounced angina, which is some type of chest pain. And for men, men usually describe it as a, a chest pain, but women often don't do that. They use different language. Like, I have pressure. If, if I feel like if I could only burp, that I would feel better. It's, I'm just uncomfortable. And if it lasts more than a few minutes or it comes and goes, it's a symptom of coronary artery disease. Another, especially for women, <clears throat> neck, jaw, shoulder, upper back, or upper belly discomfort. It, women's language and these particular symptoms also cause a lot of women to be sent home misdiagnosed from an emergency department. They're told that <clears throat> it's an anxiety attack or that it's just indigestion. Um, shortness of breath, boy, that's a big one. Pain in one or both of your arms, particularly the left arm. Nausea or vomiting. My, uh, my personal experience was that I had nausea in my shoulder and jaw and arm, which doesn't make sense, but it was just such a weird sensation. Um, sweating, lightheadedness or dizziness, unusual fatigue, and heartburn, indigestion. And these are symptoms that are really um, common to both men and women, though <clears throat> nausea um, and sweating and heartburn are usually mostly for women. Okay, and what are the I think these are the risk factors, right? Okay, the first one, these are general risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And, <coughs> excuse me, and these are for men and women. Age, I told you that, you know, men at, from about 65 on, uh, women at 70 or even a decade younger. Family history, this is very important to me because my dad, my dad and all three of my brothers had their first heart attacks before age 45. And any first degree relative, which is a parent or a sibling, 
who, if it's a man, has a heart, heart attack before age 55 or a woman before age 65. That's counted as a risk factor. And I have four of them. Um, and that's something you can't control your age and you can't control your family history. Hypertension is a really important risk factor that you can change. It, the CDC has recently said that they think it's, it causes 40% of, of this cardiovascular disease. The thing about high blood pressure though, is it, traditionally we've just gone to the doctor's office, they take your blood pressure. Okay, so what is your blood pressure? Well, remember when the pump squeezes, that's the, the systole, the, the um, top number, and that's how high, that's how hard it's pumping to push mercury up a tube. Remember what, do you remember the old um, blood pressure machines that were like big thermometers on the wall? And so it's how, how much, how far it goes in like 120, let's take 120 over 80. The systole on that is 120. And that means when your heart squeezes, it pushes the mercury up about five, a little over five inches and about five inches, yeah. And the diastole, which is the, the lower number and the smaller number is when the heart relaxes to let the blood come in to that chamber. So um, it used to be believed that a high blood pressure in the olden days, by the olden days, I mean like before 1945, uh, which is not that old, um, it was considered, high blood pressure was considered a sign of vigor of your heart. They just didn't know any better. And it was when Franklin Roosevelt died in 1945, it was in April of 45, his blood pressure, I think he was 63 years old, it shot up to 300 over 190. And he died very shortly thereafter. And that was when people started to look at it. Doctors started to look at that and go, oh, that, that is obviously not a sign of a vigorous heart. So hypertension or high blood pressure can be controlled with drugs. And also nowadays we have machines that we can have at home. It used to be that you only had your blood pressure taken when you went to your doctor. When was that? Once a year? Maybe you could have it taken at the grocery store too, but that or the uh, pharmacy, but those aren't accurate. Nowadays with our little, this one's a little rip, wrist wraparound cuff and it was recommended to me um, by my occupational therapist when I was in the hospital and it turns out I if I'm not feeling well I track my blood pressure and it's good to have a regular record of it to figure out if you really do have high blood pressure diabetes diabetes is a really high risk factor for cardiovascular disease unhealthy cholesterol levels especially your LDL level it's correlated overweight or abdominal obesity i am technically normal weight <clears throat> just by just under a hair of overweight but my waist size is way too much because i'm carrying all abdominal fat so a woman's waist should be below 35 inches or below and men i think it's 42 inches or below i haven't looked at that figure for a while the re even if you can lose, and I know how hard it is. I've been carrying, I've been trying to lose these last 10 pounds for 10 years. Um, even if you lose one pound of fat, you will lose five miles worth of blood vessels. So that makes it that much easier on your heart. An unhealthy diet. I was raised in the Midwest where the bacon fat can was on the back of the stove and that's what you fried your eggs and potatoes and onions and everything in so saturated fat especially animal products um a healthy diet is i love michael pollan's description um eat food meat by that he means real food not too much mostly plants the mediterranean diet which is mostly fruits and vegetables really plant-based whole foods plant-based is turning out to be the healthiest diet for heart disease. Not enough physical activity. We tend to be very sedentary. Move. 
is you should do at least 30 minutes of activity at least five times a week. Smoking. The CDC recently believed, um, printed out or, or reported that they believe that smoking is responsible for 20% of the deaths. And my dad and one of my older brothers was still smoking when they died. Too much alcohol. One glass of wine is five ounces, period. No more than one glass, no more than one drink for a woman every day. Gum disease, I've already told you about that because the infection can move to your heart. And a, it's a real risk factor to have poor access to health care. It was hard enough for me to get in on time to get my life saved, and I had good health care. So that's a systemic problem that you can't control. But most of these things, from hypertension down to gum disease, those, those really contribute about 80% of your risk, and you do have some control over that. Ah, now here are sex specific risk factors. I don't know if I told you this yet, but the cardiologists, the women cardiologists primarily, the, or the cardiologists who are at the women's heart health clinics have a very specific um, term for sex specific issues and gender specific issues. Sex specific issues have to do with genetics and gender specific or differentiations between male and female outcomes for heart disease are based on socioeconomic, like societal um, gender roles, that sort of thing out here. This is how, this is what we, we tell ourselves, how we're supposed to act. And these are none that we do. Okay, so the sex specific risk factors, pregnancy and delivery are both big risk factors. It delivers really hard on your heart. Um, so as I said, if you can make it through that, it's the best stress test there is. But pregnancy, there are pregnancy complications that actually increase your risk later in life. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Long after your pregnancy. Um, if, if you had these things during pregnancy, then you have more risk later on high blood pressure, preeclampsia, eclampsia, those are all blood pressure issues. If the birth weight is too low or too high, a preterm birth, low gestational weight of the fetus, um, just meaning that in, in utero, the, the fetus was too small for the amount of time that it spent in the um, inside, and then gestational diabetes. It, pregnancy brings on diabetes for some women. Um, breast cancer treatment. They've gotten better, but back a while, the breast cancer treatments, the radiation has caused, that was in the chest wall caused, has caused some damage to hearts. And that's showing up now. And some chemo for the breasts is showing up as a later risk factor. Autoimmune diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, women tend to have those in, at higher frequency than men. Early menopause, again, estrogen seems to have a protective um, factor, seems to be a protective factor for delaying onset of cardiovascular disease. Migraines with auras are also a risk that factor and oral contraceptive use long ago or currently. So those are sex specific. But some gender disparities, these are ones that are more societal, social societal. Women are more likely than men to die from heart disease, to die from their first heart attack, to have a second heart attack, to die after bypass surgery, to not be included in research studies. I think we're up to 25 to 30% in research studies now. They tend not to be referred for cardiac rehabil rehabilitation after they are eligible after a major event and yet it doesn't get prescribed for them. They tend to delay seeking medical care. Oh, I'm fine. No, it's it really, um, no, it's just a little indigestion. 
um, they tend to be misdiagnosed. And interestingly, they don't receive proper medicines, including even aspirin following a heart attack, even in an ambulance. And there was, this was one of the most interesting things that I, the oddest little thing that I saw recently. And that is there was a study from 2014 to 2018, I think it was a four year study. And it was by the agency that um, regulates and records things for emergency response services. And what they found going through all their calls in all these agencies throughout the United States for four years is that women who are put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital because of a heart attack, that's what's been reported, they don't nearly get transported as often as men with sirens and lights. There are no sirens and lights for a lot of women when they go in, which I thought that was, I thought that was a very odd and interesting thing. I don't know how significant it is, but it, it's just, a, again, an indicator of maybe it's not perceived to be as interesting. This is a new, fairly new piece of data that I just found today. And the, this is from the CDC, and this is male versus female myocardial, myocardial infarction or heart attack treatment. You can see the red are men and the blue are women and men get a, almost uniformly a little bit more than half of uh, twice as much treatment as women do. And coronary revascularization, that means putting in a stent or doing open, by, open heart surgery bypass so that you're getting the blood. You are, make, you are revascularizing that heart. Antiplatelet therapy, just taking simple drugs like that, blood thinners, and preventative treatments, including statins. So, right from the CDC. So you have to. The, my next, my next point is we have to advocate for ourselves. We can advocate for ourselves. We just have to. Um, we just have to help educate people. Okay, so here we are. What can you do besides lifestyle changes to mitigate your risk factors? Okay, know what the symptoms of cardiac um, coronary artery disease are and track them. So like keep track of your blood pressure and your heart rate. Know your numbers. What is your cholesterol number? What's your diabetes number? Uh, what's your diabetes risk? And Create a detailed history and risk factor list. This is really important. Give it to your primary care doc and to any emergency personnel. Because, you know, you go into a doctor's office and they hand you a clipboard and it says, okay, fill out your history. Did you ever have rheumatic heart fever or whatever? You fill out all this stuff and you do it two pages and you get about, I don't know, 10 minutes. And then your doctor just scans that quickly. So I think it could really help them take good care of us if we give them the information that they need. So be very specific about your family history, um, for example. Oh, all right. So this is the slow onset heart attack. Every, everybody thinks of the heart attack. Oh, I kind of have this chest pressure and I better call 911 because I'm having, I'm sweating and I'm feeling nauseated and this isn't right and I need to go to the doctor. And so people act, even women will act pretty quickly in getting themselves in, you don't drive yourself, don't do that. Call an ambulance and get transported to the hospital. But not all heart attacks look like that. There is something that's only really recently I, been identified in the literature, but I know about it because I had it, and it's the slow onset heart attack. And one woman's story, that's my story. And um, interestingly, I, it was only this morning that I realized that I have never told this story in public before. And so I I'm screen sharing and now I'm going to stop the share. So you're going to see me again, I think. I don't know if you will or not. Um, and 
I've just, I, I've told some friends and I've told my family, but um, so if you see me getting tender and maybe crying a little bit, it's because it's the first time I've really publicly exposed it. And it's not because I'm sad. It's because I'm so wildly grateful to be alive. Um, so I was 11 years old when I was told that I had to watch for heart disease. I was sitting at the kitchen table with my mom and my dad's cardiologist, fairly prominent cardiologist in Detroit. And my dad had died about three weeks before and he was going through some stuff with my mom. Now, the fact that the cardiologist was sitting at our kitchen table having a cup of coffee with my mom was not that unusual because he made, this was 1959, and he made heart um, house calls to our house. My dad had three major heart attacks from when he was 45 until he was 54. That was the last one. That was the one that killed him. But what he really had was congestive heart failure. What that meant was, what that means is, with each heart attack, it um, killed more of his heart muscle in the left ventricle. So the main pump was not able to pump enough blood out to be able to support him. So um, actually, both of my two older brothers and my dad died of of congestive heart failure and that's what it was they all had heart attacks that did the damage then they couldn't pump their blood <clears throat> so um he was at our so he came to our house when my dad was too sick to go to an appointment or couldn't get out of bed and wasn't in the hospital so he was uh, the, everybody in the family knew him and what he said was cheryl you're gonna the boys all have to watch out for heart disease and it turned out to be very true one had his first heart attack at 38, one at 40, one at 42, and my dad at 45. Those were their first heart attacks. And Cheryl, you'll be fine until you go through menopause, which I had just started menstruating at 11, and so I wasn't quite ready for menopause, but I, I knew I would have some protection, but I was certainly given a heads up. And given how much heart disease was in my family, then I knew what to watch for. I knew about the shortness of breath, um, I knew about nitroglycerin. My dad used, it's a very old um, technology. And when you take nitroglycerin, these tiny little pills, and you put them under your, under your tongue, they help to dilate your blood vessels and they can buy you some time if you're in the middle of a heart attack or they can just make your angina subside. So um, anyway, I was watching for it went through life, I was pretty careful with my, my diet and I got a lot of exercise and I was like, I was a healthy one. I was pretty good at stress management. And then in 2018, no, well, actually 2015, I was subbing that day. I was subbing one day for, uh, at the pie program in Chimicum and I woke up in the morning and I had a, like a really harsh pain in my chest and it was like a spasm. And so when you're the sub, it's hard to get another sub. So I said, well, I'm going to go to school anyway. And I went and I taught school all day and it, it, the pain subsided for the most part. But by the time I was done with school at 2.30, there was still enough pain there. And it, it came back a little bit harsher. I thought, I better call my doctor. So I called my doctor and I said, I don't know if I should come in. And, and I talked to his assistant and um, she said, come now, we'll make room for you. He's here. So I went down there and of course I'm sitting in the office and she took my blood pressure and did all that stuff. And he walks in and he said, well, and how are you? And I said, oh, I'm fine. He said, other than a heart attack. I said, no, 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 it, it was fine. So he sent me for an EKG and it turns out he didn't, um, it looked okay, but he sent me for a stress test just for the heck of it. Went through the, uh, got on the treadmill, did just fine. They put all kinds of electrodes on you and they take an electrocardiogram. That's the measurement of the, all, the electrical activity of your heart. And if that looks good, it's got certain patterns. The pattern looked good. And so they said, okay, you're fine. Then in 2018, November, it was quiet. The wood stove was going, it was dark, it was night. And I was reading and a New Yorker magazine. And I got the weirdest pain in my right arm. And I thought, this is weird. I've never had this before. But 
I was warned, so I thought this could be heart, but then it went away. A couple of weeks later, just around Christmas, either just before or just after, I was sitting again in the evening, quietly knitting, and I got the pain in my jaw and neck and shoulder and left arm, but it wasn't a pain. Like I said before, it was like, if you could have nausea in your body, that's what was going on. So I, the next day I called my doctor and I said, something's going on and it's not right. And so I, I said, it's, it's a sensation that I've never had before. And it's on my left, from my left jaw, down the arm, it, it's, it's hard. I think I need to come in. He said, come in right away. Again, I had an EKG, which they have it right in his office, um, down in the little lab. He looked at it and he said, okay, I want you to have a stress test. This doesn't, he saw something in there that he didn't like. I went for a treadmill stress test a week later. I got, a, got all taped up with all these little electrodes all over. Got on the treadmill. I wasn't on the treadmill 45 seconds and the tech stopped me and took me off. It didn't look good. So <clears throat> they, she got a little bit of a reading and at that time, I was referred to a cardiologist because that wasn't right. So um, the cardiologist was in that same building. He ordered what's called a nuclear stress test. And the nuclear stress test is they inject, you know, they put radiation in, you, in your blood and they take pictures of your heart to see how much of the blood has been taken up in the muscle of your heart. So it, it's bright. It's kind of cute. It's, they... The, the, the um, cameras that are over you take like donut slices, like that. So they look, when I saw pictures of them, they look like, like slices of donuts, this bright color and kind of bright, I don't know, orangey color, and of my left ventricle particularly. Then they wanted to see whether or not my heart would get enough blood if they put me under stress, but I couldn't get on the machine so they put me in a chair, they gave me an injection that made my heart speed up like crazy. And it was only for a minute and a half. And then they gave me another injection that took my heart rate back down and waited a while. And then they took another series of pictures. And this time, I, the muscle was not nice, like a donut. Instead, it was like this, that there was a part missing, which means there was a part of my heart that was not taking up blood. It couldn't it was working too hard to be able to take in the nourishment that it needed. The first time I took my son with me. This is a really important tip. Tip: If you are having heart symptoms, you need to have a responsible, trusted person to go with you, either a partner or a child or a friend or a woman heart champion, if you don't have anybody else, to be your extra set of ears. Well, it just went on and um, I, took this pill and didn't tolerate it. And he said, you should get an angiogram. I went, oh, I'm afraid of an angiogram. Let me think about it. The family comes, we spend the summer. Fourth, and he, even though he said an angiogram, I let, I let that go, I dropped it. Uh, an angiogram is where they stick a catheter either through your groin or in mine does it through the wrist. And they snake this thing up into your heart while they're taking a, a moving X-ray, a video, x-ray and they squirt something into you, this dye into your artery go right up the artery and squirt and then they can see when it fills in that darkness fills in they can see any narrowing of the artery i finally got an appointment for one in uh, late august even though i was having symptoms that were so extreme that i tried to get in earlier but i couldn't went in for this angiogram and I, we walked in my my son and his partner who had, she had just graduated from um, nursing school and was working full time as a nurse but she came with us we went down to harrison we walked in on the way the kids drove me i went okay where am i going to take you for lunch afterwards and i thought well maybe i'll have to get a stent because i'm not feeling you know i'm feeling woozy I, I have to take a lot of nitroglycerin this is really pretty bad. I went to a memorial service, Jill Hoyne's memorial service. If you guys remember that, it was down at the bottom of the hill. Afterwards, I was walking up the hill. I had to stop 
three times to lie down on the grass because I needed to catch my breath. And I remember looking at the sky thinking, gosh, that's pretty. How often do you ever just stop and look up at the sky? The third time I went down, I closed my eyes and I heard a voice in my ear. It was a young woman and she said, are you all right? Oh yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I, I've got an angiogram coming up in a couple of weeks and I'll be fine. I, so that was probably a day that I was having a heart attack, that particular one. It was pretty severe, the symptoms. Went in for the an angiogram. Okay, I'm gonna take you guys to lunch afterwards. On the table, I heard the equivalent, because you're kind of in twilight, you're in a cath lab, that's what they call the catheterization. It's, it's a mildly invasive procedure. Obviously, if they're sticking something up your arm or up your groin and to get into your heart. And um, I heard the equivalent of, holy crap, <laughs> when they tried to shoot blood into my arteries, it bounced out of two of them. My right artery was 100% blocked, main artery. The Widowmaker, the left anterior descending artery was 99% blocked. And the, which is tantamount to 100%. And the circumflex that went around um, was 70% blocked. And the only thing that was keeping me alive is my heart had created its own bypass. Everyone has what are called collaterals, or most people have collaterals at the bottom of their heart. And these are collapsed vessels that ordinary, they can, they can be very bad if they fill up and start working because they don't go along the regular channels. But mine had opened up and my heart was being fed by these feeble little blood vessels that were working across it to feed the rest of my heart. I was so fragile that he, they instantly inserted a pump up through my vein. It's a, it's a balloon pump and it was a reciprocating pump. So it assisted my heart. It is the, the tool that they use when someone is put in the hospital waiting for a heart transplant. Um, and I had had this major talk with my, uh, with my guy, um, my cardiologist like just two or three weeks before. And I said, I do not want open heart surgery because my mother had had it and died from complications of it later and a heart attack, complications that led to a heart attack. That was in 1984, it was much more primitive then, but I was, I really didn't want to have um, open heart surgery. I asked him, how often in your practice have you had to go right from the cath table, from an angiogram to open heart surgery? He said, I can count them on one hand. When we were done with this process and I saw him, he said, now I have to add another hand. Um, I was whisked to the ICU, the CCU, the intensive care where I could not move because this pump is sitting right in your aorta. I had lots of visitors. Less than 20, less than 48 hours later, I had emergency open heart surgery of three-way bypass. And um, I'm, I'm actually a cabbage times three. It means coronary artery bypass graft. And I have three of them. They put them in. Um, and I was in ICU for another couple of days because they didn't even take the, the pump out until they were sure everything was working. And I spent, I, I went to um, skilled nursing after that. I came home and it's been oh, cool. what you're listening to it sounds it's terrible cheryl's talk oh it well yeah it was exciting yeah it was it was i'm supposed to tell my story <laughs> and that was my story and i didn't cry i cried a lot this morning when i said it out loud so now but you can you can see my the artery that you have a 12 percent chance to survive it if it's blocked and i had been walking around with that i I was just so blessed to have that team and those people and the timing. I probably, the next presentation of my symptoms would have very probably been death. So I feel like I've been given an extra, an extra bit of heart. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And do you have any questions? 
So is there any natural way, if you have a buildup of, uh, hi, Cheryl. Hi, Joni. <laughs> if you have a buildup of plaque, is there any natural way of treating it? That, you know, that's a really good question. Dean Ornish, there's a whole, there are a number of doctors who are, by the way, I just want to introduce, Joni is my friend from when I was three years old and she was five. No. Yeah, you were five and I was three. So we've been friends for 70 years. Um, we And so, uh, yes, Dean Ornish and people of his ilk, there actually is clinical evidence that his program can reverse heart disease. It's been tracked with angiograms. And what it is, is total plant-based, no, um, very little, very, very little animal products, no oil, no refined sugar. It's a very strict diet. It's a stress management program and an exercise program. It's like a very elaborate um, cardiac rehab program. And the reason I mention that is because it has been approved by Medicare. And, and it's kind of alternative. He is an MD, but there's a whole bunch of doctors who say eat plants, no oil, no added sugars, eat fruits and vegetables and starches. They, um, I think Ornish is the only one that's really been sort of approved in that. But that, that comes up over and over again. And get exercise, get good sleep, don't drink too much, don't smoke, don't eat ice cream every night. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So yeah, there are natural remedies, but some doctors will say no. Now, this was a really interesting thing. One of the reasons I objected to getting coronary, getting a bypass, getting open heart surgery, which is, by the way, pretty dramatic. I mean, it does take a while to recover from it. Um, or even an angiogram is because statistically, those procedures do not change your outcome at the end of seven years. That if you're going to, you have the same number of heart attacks in seven years that you would have had whether you had the, that surgery or not. And the reason is the surgery does not cure the disease. That was one of the most important things that the, my cardiologist told me, and I still use that. So I have modified my diet. I have modified my drinking to the point of almost none. Um, I have modified my exercise. My family bought me a Fitbit for Christmas. And so that has me walking more. So I, um, I have changed and really how I modify my stress. I, I allowed myself, I allowed myself to get too stressed out when it all came down. So there we have it. Any other questions? Carol, this is Jim. Thanks much for your presentation. Um, I, want, I want to build up with Joan's question. Um, so what I believe I heard you say is that uh, with certain conditions, it is naturally, uh, along with medicals probably as well, it, it's possible to slowly reverse the plaque buildup. Uh, can it ever actually go away? Yes. Ornish has documented with pictures from angiograms, reversal after two to three years of blockages in major arteries. So, but that's done with, it's a pretty strict regimen. And what they, what I think what um, doctors assume is that it's so hard to make major lifestyle changes that most people won't do it. So the pills are what you use instead. So it's statins. Statins actually are, are a fairly, I, I can't tolerate statins very well, but statins are to, meant to lower your cholesterol. But really what they're for is they have some sort of beneficial effect on the interior, the epithelial lining of your arteries that um, it somehow keeps them cleaner or less likely to attract things. So, boy, they're hard for me to take. So, I don't do well with um, medications. Did that answer it, Jim? 
Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Carol? Carol, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Marty, yeah. Uh, this is a book that Patty has recommended. Yep, pull uh, it back a little bit. I've got that one, by the way. Esselstein, yeah. Yeah, and it's Esselstein, okay, some yeah. Some of our friends on the island have uh, followed this program. Uh, and it is documented that it will reverse heart disease. I don't know if you can see it or not. Yeah, hold, hold prevent, yeah. Esselstyn is another one. Esselstyn, Ornish, good, if you hold it still. Prevent and reverse heart disease by Caldwell Esselstyn. That whole Esselstyn family. If you guys have never heard of the vegan firefighter, that's the Esselstyn man. And he's, they've written cookbooks and all sorts of stuff. And they are strictly, Esselstyn will, he can rattle off 12 kinds of greens. It's broccoli, kale, bok choy, all this other that you're supposed to eat every day. And they are just, they're real plant, plant-based, no fat, no sugar, just relentless on it. And it does work. I'm gonna put, um, I'm gonna have, the PowerPoint and a handout with resources. And I will put that book on that, that will be downloadable. And I will put that book on it. It was great, Cheryl. You did an outstanding job. Thanks, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. We'll talk tomorrow. Great. Judy, by the way, is lives in Hadlock and she is one of four women heart champions in all of Washington State. So we are going to start, that's something new. We should, we are going to start a support group for women with heart disease in the, on the Olympic Peninsula. And we'll include the Kitsap Peninsula too. Um, so so we, we will start having support group meetings so that you can talk about your heart disease. Hi. Thank you everyone, I really appreciate it. You know, at the, at, I do have, there are, there are two more slides one that tells the um the mission statements of the maristone island foundation and also women heart but my very last slide is a quote from renee maria rilke who is a poet who is an austrian poet turn of the 20th century and it is this let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell as you ring what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the change. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate that you came out. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.